Good morning, First Baptist. I'm Hannah. And I'm Sarah. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Hey, college students. College supper is tonight. So join us from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This is a great opportunity to come together, share a meal, and build relationships with one another. Feel free to invite your friends to come along, and we hope to see you tonight. BBS will be here before you know it. This year's theme is called Twists and Turns, Following Jesus Changes the Game, and this will be June 5th through 9th. If you have a heart for children in ministry, this is a great way to get involved. We have many different areas that need volunteers, so we will have a spot for you to use your gifts in order to serve. If you are interested in volunteering, please scan the QR code in the worship guide or call the office to get registered. Students, join our student ministry at Merge 2023. This will be an amazing weekend of worship, fun, growth, and fellowship at Sky Ranch Camp in Oklahoma. This year's event will be March 31st through April 2nd. We are praying for God to move the hearts of our students so, we can, so they can live free and unified in Christ. If you're interested in attending, you can scan the QR code in the worship guide and get signed up today. Speaking of student ministry, Jed and many others are passionate about discipling the next generation and you can help impact these students' lives. First and foremost, you can support by bathing this ever-growing ministry in prayer. Secondly, if you feel called to serve in this area, we would love to talk with you about what that might look like. And lastly, we desire each of our students to be able to participate, therefore offering scholarships to meet needs as we can. So next Sunday, we will have a second offering as we leave each service for student scholarships. Funds collected will allow other students to attend these impactful events like merch. Please consider how God may be leading you to support our student ministry. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, we invite you to text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322 or you can visit one of the info hubs after the service where we can meet you and help you get connected to First Baptist Bolivar. Let's worship. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Bolivar. We're glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are watching online or listening on the radio as well. We're going to begin with a, uh, an announcement from our personnel chair, Mike Tennyson. He's here to share some news with us. Good morning, church. Um, I think there's going to be a slide up here. Um, yes, so um, we are excited. We have a committee for the children's ministry director, um, and they met the first time last week. Um, and so um, this is such an important thing for our church and, and such an exciting thing for our church. And so as you guys go out this week, we would like you to pray for these people. Um, pray that God um, lays on their heart um, exactly, you know, what the job description fully needs to be and, and, and who the person is and, and that and God just brings the right people um, for, uh, for this position. We are so excited as, as this position has been a great um, thing in this church and, and the ministry is growing and so we are excited to keep that growing. So um, if you are on this committee, and I know most, I think most of them, I think maybe Holly, maybe the only one, in, um, if you wouldn't mind standing up and then um, and if there's anybody else, I don't think. Um, and honestly, right now, we're just going to take it and just pray over them. Um, and I'll pray over them real quick. Um, God, we thank you so much for what you're doing at First Baptist. Um, we're so grateful for uh, the legacy of the, of the children's ministry. Um, and we're so excited for the future as well. God, we just pray over um, these, these committee members. God, we pray that you will give them wisdom, um, that you will give them um, just the right words and, and the focus to, to help find um, the next uh, children's uh, ministry director, God. We're so grateful um, for what this is going to do um, at First Baptist, and we're so grateful for um, just all that you are doing. God, we just um, love you, and we just ask all this in your name. Thank you. Amen. Let's stand together for a responsive reading from God's Word. Psalm 34. 8 through 10. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger.
Let's sing together hymn 163, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. <laughs> Please pray with me. Father God, I just want to thank you for all the things that you do for us, all the blessings and the gifts that you give us daily. We, we thank you for that, Lord, and we ask that you help us to uh, know how we best can share those with others and to utilize those gifts. Guard us and guide us, Lord. Help us through this day and help us to return back to you generously and cheerfully as you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hi, everyone. We're excited tonight that uh, Marissa, everybody say hi, Marissa. Hey, Marissa. Is uh, going to be baptized tonight. And we've asked Sherry to read her testimony. Growing up, I was never exposed to God. My family never attended church, spoke about him, or prayed. I haven't been one to claim religion or talk about him. I never thought or cared about having faith in him. Actually, I denied him and lived such a brash life. I always did what I wanted to, never thinking about the consequences. Then late last year, I lost my brother. I became even more angry and scared. My anxiety began to take control over my life. I was having panic attacks multiple times a day. I was constantly thinking, I'm next. God is going to take me next because of the life I've lived. My anxiety paralyzed me. I started to seek help and comfort anywhere I could. I started trying to learn about God, but I thought that my sins were too great for him to forgive. This gave me more anxiety. After weeks like this, I had a bad panic attack one day and had to leave work. I went to my best friend's house, and I cannot ever truly express the feeling I got sitting at her table talking about God. She opened up a passage in the Bible about God's love being unconditional. She had me read it, and I immediately received peace. A wave of calm hit me. I could breathe again. I felt overwhelming love. I realized in that moment that it didn't matter that I hadn't grown up in church or that I hadn't praised him before now or even that I had denied him and committed sins. From that point on, I started my walk with God. I don't understand it all, but God has led me in my journey. After much prayer and more understanding of his word, I'm fully committed to him. I'm so grateful that I can now see him working in my life in so many ways, and I am beyond excited to outwardly declare my love for Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. Amen. A few weeks ago, Marissa and her husband caught me before the Esquire and asked if I would pray with them and uh, just show them what it means to be a Christian. And we did that. We prayed. And what an exciting, exciting moment. Uh, Marissa, was that your testimony we just heard? And do you believe that Jesus really lived a perfect life and that he died and rose again after three days? And have you accepted him as your personal savior to forgive all of your sins? Then based on your profession of faith and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his glorious resurrection. Amen. 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 Let's continue our worship with a reading from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's stand together as we sing, What a Beautiful Name.
As we start a, another sermon series today that I'll talk more about in just a moment, would you join me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, and we're going to look together today at verses 1 through 21, Mark 8, 1 through 21. We just finished last week our Gospel Culture series, and I would just say to you, if you missed one of those messages or you'd like to go back and review them, you can find them on Facebook or on our website Certainly would encourage you to do that. But we're starting today a new five-week series that, believe it or not, will lead us up to Palm Sunday. So we're heading towards Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter. And you would say, really, like Easter's only like six weeks away? Didn't we just come out of Christmas and New Year's? And I would say, yes and yes. <laughs> we did just come out of Christmas and New Year's, it seems like. And yes, Easter will be here in about a month and a half. And so both of those things believe it or not, are true. So really what we want to do in this series we're calling Scenes from the Life of Christ is we want to we take a snapshot of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8 and 9. And we want to see from the life and teaching and ministry of Jesus what he's doing and how he's dealing with people. And then, hopefully this will make sense, at the end of chapter 9, essentially he turns his face towards Jerusalem where he's going to die, to accomplish what is necessary for the gospel. And so we want to track along with him in our preparation for Passion Week as we prepare ourselves for Easter. So with that in mind, we look together today at Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. And as you focus your attention there, let me just ask you a question. You ever had the opportunity or known someone that had the opportunity to be in the room with someone that was thought of as kind of being bigger than life itself? Like that person is bigger than life itself and like somehow being in the room with them would change your life. Well, I had the opportunity, at least for me, to be in the room with such a person when I was in college, to set the context for this, let me take us back all the way to the NCAA men's college basketball tournament of 1979, the year I was born. That year, famously, Larry Bird's Indiana State Sycamores lost to Magic Johnson's Michigan State Spartans in the championship that year. And so we know those names. But there's actually a Another individual that played for another team that made it to the Elite Eight that went on that had a career that kind of, not as famously, but mirrored theirs. They all were top five picks in the NBA draft. As a matter of fact, this individual that I'm talking about, even though it was a different year, was picked one pick higher than Larry Bird. They all had 10-plus year careers in the NBA, and all of them were multi-year all-stars. And I had the opportunity one time to be in the, cage, uh, in the room with this individual. As I've already said, it's not the aforementioned Larry Bird or Magic Johnson, but I had the opportunity. And by the way, if you're from Arkansas, this person's even more famous to be in the room with none other than Sidney Moncrief. Now, a lot of you guys don't even know who that is. But you might say, well, how in the world did you find yourself in the room with Sidney Moncrief? Well, at the time, I was a college student at the school that he came to be the head basketball coach at. And I had a class that several of his players were in. I don't know, you have to talk to players that play today. I don't know if this is still the case. But back then, they would do class checks to make sure their players were actually <laughs> attending class. And this particular morning, the door opened, and in stepped Sidney Moncrief in order to make sure on his own that a couple of his players we're in class. Now, I will tell you, there was a reaction all over the room, but the reaction of his players was quite a bit different than the reaction than the rest of the room. Their reaction action was sheer terror. Ours was sheer awe and elation. And I remember the guy sitting next to me almost fell out of his chair, and I didn't quite react that way. And then he says those infamous words, don't you know who that is? And I absolutely know who that was, and, and it's not that I didn't care, but I will tell you this. I can say, other than material for sermons or stories at parties, it has not changed my life one bit. <laughs> he didn't give me any of his money. I didn't immediately get better at basketball. It didn't change my life one bit. In this passage of Scripture, we obviously know the main character. 
But I think as we read what happens here and a question that's asked, we do well to say, what about when we're in the presence of Jesus? How should we respond? And to ask it perhaps a better way, is knowing the identity and being in the presence of Jesus life-altering? And if it is, why or, or why not? There's an event that happens here, and then there's some responses to that event, and then Jesus asks a question about all of those things that goes a long way to help us at least consider this question this morning. So I want us to look at this passage, and I want to move through it by looking at what I'll refer to as four movements that will at least help us reflect on and consider such a question. So first of all, in verses 1 through 9, I want us to look at what I'm calling the feeding, the event itself, the feeding. This is what the text tells us. In those days when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they've remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve them, and they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large basket, baskets full of what was left over of the broken, broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. Just two chapters before, Mark records for us a feeding of 5,000 people. Now, what you might find interesting and what might be significant for us is all four Gospels record the feeding of the 5,000. But there's only two Gospels that record for us the feeding of the 4,000. Obviously, here in Mark and Matthew. That's led some people to say, well, maybe there was just one feeding. Maybe Jesus just did this once, and this is kind of a, a doublet, a doubling of the account. You know, changing it a little bit and repeating it, Jesus only did this one time. I, I certainly would say maybe that's possible because the Gospels are not always interested in strict chronology, but also from the end of John's Gospel, here's what we can say. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that Jesus did two different feedings or three different feedings, or ten different feedings, because John himself says, look, everything that Jesus did is not recorded, because if we try to do that, there's not enough volumes on the planet that could hold them. And so this very well could have been a separate feeding. It's, it's actually the, the position that I take, and there's a few reasons why. There's enough of a difference of detail, and it's not simply the number of people that are fed. I would tell you it's even the location. We think from a, from a geography standpoint that this particular feeding happened in a region around the Sea of Galilee known as the Decapolis. Now, what does that matter? Well, it was a region of about 10 cities that was not predominantly populated by Jews, but was more populated by the Gentiles. In the previous feeding, it looks like the predominant audience was the Jews. And so here, it's Gentiles. And also, a little bit later in the story, you're going to see that when he's questioning the disciples, he brings up the two different feedings. Though I think Mark has intentionally arranged these two feedings that did actually occur separately to make a point. Or perhaps better yet, to bring a test to the disciples. This, if you will, is a bit of a spiritual assessment to check and see where are the disciples at at this point in their life. Or better yet, at this point in Jesus' ministry. And as it becomes an assessment for them, perhaps today it becomes an assessment for us. What do we see? Where are we at? What do we believe about Jesus and where are we at in our life? And with that in mind, could we just consider just a few of the details that we see at the end? We focus on the miracle itself. We see verses 4 through 9, and some of these details are, we're very familiar with. You know, here's these people. There's about 4,000 at least men, so probably men, women, and children, maybe three times that many. 
and they're hungry, and they've been there a while. And if they try to go home, they probably won't make it. And so Jesus takes the seven loaves that they have, and he blesses, and he breaks it, and he uses the partnership with the disciples to feed them, to serve them, and they eat, and interesting enough, they're satisfied. But beyond that, the text tells us that this miracle that occurred was so phenomenal that they have leftovers. But not just a few leftovers. They have leftovers enough for these seven loaves to fill seven baskets. And by the way, the word for basket that's used here is not the same word that's used of the basket of the 12 baskets full of leftovers they had the previous time. This is a word that refers to large baskets. Think luggage. Think large luggage that people would use to carry their effects around. These were large baskets, and they had enough to fill seven baskets of those. I would also tell you, I think the location that this happens is not insignificant. Did you catch it? A desolate place. Maybe translation, a desert. Some have said perhaps this is a reference back to the fact that in the Old Testament, this is God. This is God in the flesh doing what only God did. When the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, he fed them with bread from heaven. He fed them in the desert, in the wilderness, with manna, with bread. Maybe that's the case. I also believe that there might be a reference here to Isaiah 35 that tells us during the Messianic age, the desert will bloom. Well, in some ways, the desert is blooming, but it's not blooming so much from the bread that they're eating, but it's blooming from the Messiah himself. He is the bloom in the wilderness. That's certainly what we see. What I find fascinating also is this idea of it's not like, you know, Jesus had the seven, but it's not like if that wasn't enough, he could have gone to God and sons and bought more bread. It didn't exist there. He could have gone to the grocery store and got the things he needed to make more. This is all that was there. But that's the, the, the truth of our God, isn't it? We know him as a God who creates out of nothing. He did that in Genesis 1. He created out of nothing. Well, in some sense, he does the same thing here, and they are satisfied. Maybe those are the, the details we know, and, and, and we shouldn't get so used to them that we just pass over. We shouldn't become calloused and cold to them. But I think when we look at the details, we often forget what led into him performing this miracle. Because if you go back to verses 1 through 3, you don't just see the miracle, but you see the motivation for Jesus doing what he did, which may be as interestingly significantly as important. It wasn't just the miracle he did, but it was the motivation. Did you catch it? He saw the people and he felt compassion for them. Jesus cared for these people. So maybe we need to rearrange our statement or edit it just a little bit. It's not just simply to assess the disciples that he did it. He did it because people had needs. They had real needs, and Jesus cared in in his spirit, in his soul, cared enough to meet them where they were in this he does. Interesting, in Mark chapter 6, which led into the previous feeding, the same exact word is used. Jesus felt compassion. But in Mark chapter 6, the immediate response to his compassion is not actually the feeding, it's teaching. Jesus saw them, he felt compassion for them, so he taught them. There's something to be said about the compassion of Jesus. There's something to be said about its motivation And we understand that it's motivation that could only come from God itself. But when we look, Jesus often felt compassion for people, and it usually resulted in him meeting a physical need, often feeding or teaching them. I think in this, we see the greatest model for actually shepherding. Jesus is the greatest model of the good shepherd. He he has compassion for people, so he feeds them. He has compassion for people, so he teaches them. And sometimes he feeds them by teaching them. The very word of God, a model of shepherding. And so here, in Jesus showing that he can only be the one that he is, marries the motivation of God with the miracle of God. And we shouldn't miss that. We shouldn't miss that there's both, both ends, both sides of what the event is happening here. To say it another way, We see the compassion that can only come from God in the capabilities that can only be that of God's, and it shows us this is none other than the Son of God. That is the point. And maybe in the feeding of the 5,000, he was showing his compassion and care and provision for the Jews, and here he's showing his compassion and care for the Gentiles. 
we look at all that, and what we do well to ask is, but what was the response? How would people respond? And in the rest of this passage, we see two responses from two different groups of people. And on the surface, perhaps we think these two responses are different. But actually, they're a whole lot more similar than we might think. And we learn that from the words of Jesus himself. We see the first response of this miracle in verses 10 through 13. It's what I will call today the fight. We see the feeding. Now we see the fight. Listen. Listen. And he immediately, he, and immediately he entered the boat with the disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, I hope as I read that, you understand the irony in those words. Right? Let's continue. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. This location, Dalmanutha, is actually only mentioned one time in the entire New Testament. We don't find references to it that we know of in any other secular literature, and so because of that, it's very difficult to exactly pinpoint where this took place. My first trip to Israel... First part of the week, we were spending some time around the Sea of Galilee, and we saw a lot of different sites. And uh, there was one particular site that we came to. It was kind of like a a fork in the road, and you took this turn. And it was one of those roads that took you a major thoroughfare kind of away from the Sea of Galilee to other regions. And right there in that crook of the road, they're actually doing quite a bit of uh, excavation right now. And in that spot, they believe they found a first century synagogue. Now, what's significant about that is you don't find a whole lot of first century synagogues, and it probably means that more than likely that that region Jesus was in, he taught in that synagogue. And this particular synagogue is in a very significant location. Let me give you two reasons why. Number one is because there was a roadside stand that we stopped at for lunch just about 100 yards or more down the road from the crook of the road, and they, and this is not an exaggeration, sell the best schnitzel shawarma and falafel and all of Israel. You have to take my word for it. But there's a second reason why this location is... So, you guys are just a tough crowd today. <laughs> Giving you my best stuff. And this is service number three. The other significant part of this is we believe it's the historical st- site of Migdala or Magdala. Well, why is that significant? Because it's where we believe Mary Magdalene grew up or came from. Mary of Magdala. And best we can tell, the geography makes sense, this is where Jesus had this confrontation with these Pharisees. It was a spiritually significant, we would say, location. Again, I'll say even to this day, it's got great bread, so you can go there and try it. But it's also spiritually significant because these things that happen. But for us, maybe the details, not of the location, but what occurs at this location is what we want to pay attention to. These Pharisees come out and they confront Jesus. Now, I would say the timing of their confrontation, maybe not the background of the confrontation, but the timing of it is really, really ironic because Jesus has just performed one of the greatest and maybe most public miracles that he did in all of his ministry, and they come to him and say, hey, we would really like a sign. And you say, well, give them a little bit of break, Pastor, because there's no indication that they were there when he did it, that they were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee with him. Maybe they didn't know about it. Well, fair enough, but it's not like that was the only sign or miracle Jesus had done. That was just one in the list or long line of many miracles that he had done. And this was just the latest. And beyond that, certainly the Pharisees would have heard about these things. It's what attracted people to him. But make no qualms about this. This is not what the Pharisees are asking. The Pharisees are not asking Jesus, would you feed people again? Uh, Jesus, would you uh, heal somebody? That would be great. Or Jesus, we've heard that you've subjugated nature. Would you do that one more time? Or how, how about an exorcism? Jesus, can you perform another exorcism? That is not so much what they're asking. What they're saying to Jesus is we double dog dare you to bring some sign that could only come from heaven, apocalyptic in nature to where we know without a shadow of a doubt God's hand of approval himself is on you. That's what they're saying. Now Jesus' response to their 
response is telling. Jesus does three things, and I don't want you to miss any of these. Number one, the text tells us that Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. Now, understand this is not Jesus in a moment losing his cool like I do with my kids, and then later I wish I wouldn't have had that outburst and do that. That's not what's happening here. There, if you will, more than anger, I think there's a deep sadness within Jesus. These people that should have been close to the Lord, that know his word, that know his law, seem to be as far from him as they've ever been. This was Jesus' common response to people's unbelief and hardened hearts. And that's his first response, to let us know he is interpreting their actions for them. The second thing he does is he kind of, in, 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 in Jewish understanding, uh, uses a, a, a major cut down for them. He calls them this generation. It's not just saying the current generation in front of you. I actually think it's a reference to Deuteronomy 32.5, the crooked or perverse generation. And he's saying you're among them. You think you're close to God, but you're so far from him. So he sighs because of their hardness of heart. He refers to them as a crooked generation. And the third thing he does, I think we probably don't make enough mention of this. Jesus left. Jesus got in the boat and got out of there. He didn't continue to talk to them or argue with them or try to convince them. That is just fascinating. Literally, Jesus gets in the boat and leaves them. And I'm not saying individually, but it's almost like Jesus is pronouncing this final judgment on them. Your heart is so hard. All I can do is, is leave. Now, we... We might look and go, well, Jesus, cut him a little bit of slack. I mean, I mean, okay, Jesus, we get it. They agitated you, but couldn't you have just obliged them here? I mean, couldn't you have given them this apocalyptic sign like lightning from heaven or the you know, moon t- turning to blood or the skies? Couldn't you have done something like that? And the answer, I guess, is yes, but let me ask two questions back if we think that's what he should have done. What type of sign would it have taken to penetrate such hardness of hearts? Let me give you an example. Would somebody rising from the dead have done it? Because remember, Jesus did that. And did it change one bit about these guys' hearts? As a matter of fact, if you look in Matthew's gospel later, he says that this generation is not getting a sign other than the sign of Jonah, which is a reference to his resurrection. And that didn't work. So what sign could he have given them here? See, the problem wasn't the sign or lack thereof. It was their faith or lack thereof. The second thing is, let's say he would have performed some grandiose spectacle, and they did believe it, then what really would the object of their faith have been? Jesus or the signs themselves? I don't have time for this this morning, but go look at John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and you'll see that Jesus thought that was a problem. You're not trusting the right thing for your salvation. So what we have here is these disciples, their response, the, the Pharisees, their response shows us that their problem is not to the signs, but their problem is their lack of faith towards Jesus. Their response matters for us. But the response we see next perhaps is even more significant to us. And the reason why is because, you know, we see the Pharisees and we go, well, that's, that's the Pharisees. I, I don't really relate to them. You know, I'm not a Pharisee. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, great, because next we get to see how the followers of Jesus responded. And if we put ourselves in a different camp, I think what we see here will go a long way to let us know where we can be sometimes. Because we see not just the feeding and the fight, but we see, I know I'm a Baptist pastor, verses 14 through 20, the float, because they're back in the boat with Jesus. I needed another F. Blame my wife. She told me to go for it. I wanted to change it. And Thursday she told me not to. So it's in your bulletin. Look with me in verses 14 through 20. And they had forgotten to take bread. By the way, I hope you see how ironic that is. And did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Goodness. Goodness. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said, Twelve. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, 
7. Now, would you imagine with me just for a moment, can we, can we use sanctified imagination and put ourselves in that moment in their shoes in the boat with Jesus? And um, you, you've just seen Jesus perform two feedings that involved him multiplying bread. You just see him have this confrontation with the Pharisees. And you've got to be thinking, man, these guys. And you get in the boat with him. I'd like to believe in that moment. Here's things I, two things I'd like to believe about myself or, that aren't true about me. Number one, I'd like to believe that if I was just with the guy that multiplied seven loaves so much that seven full suitcases could barely hold the leftovers that I wouldn't forgot, have forgotten to take some with me. Okay, I, that's just where I want to be. But the second thing, let's just assume for a moment that I am the guy or the guys that forgot to bring it with you. Here's what I would like to believe about myself next. That if that happens, my biggest concern when I'm in the boat with the bread of life himself is not loaves of bread. But yet, that's exactly where we find them. Just for a moment here, notice. So, verse 14, they're in the boat and they go, oh my goodness. We do not have enough for dinner. And so they're thinking, who ain't eating tonight? You know, we had that long day of serving, and we had the thing with the Pharisees, and somebody's not getting dinner, so let's start casting lots. Let's start drawing straws. And Jesus hears this, and he, and he looks at him and says, of the guys that they just dealt with, he says, make sure the leaven of the, scri of the Pharisees and Herod you know, make sure to be, be aware of that. It's his way of saying, watch out for it. It could happen in your life and heart as well. Now, they're not very spiritually perceptive. Their spiritual dullness makes them not start having a spiritual conversation, which is what Jesus is getting at. No, it makes them dig their heels in more talking about the bread they don't have, which leads to Jesus ending the account with asking, depending on how you look at it, a series of five to seven questions. And uh, they're really all driving at one thing that we'll see in just a moment. But I want you to notice question three and four really probably refer back to Isaiah chapter six, verses nine and ten. You remember Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six? This is this is Isaiah's commissioning that comes on the heels of this worship experience in the temple. And God says, "Whom will I send? And whom will go for us?" And Isaiah says. I, I'm right here, and God then tells him where you're going to go and go to these people with hardness of hearts, and you're going to proclaim to them, you know, keep on seeing, and, and, and you won't see, and, and keep, keep on uh, hearing, and you won't hear. Well, question three and four, which had already been applied to spiritually deaf and blind Israel, Jesus is now applying to the disciples, those that had followed him and walked with him and lived with him and seen him for the better part of three years. And he's saying, that's you. You're seeing, but you're not seeing. You're hearing, but you're, but you're deaf spiritually. Now listen, in some ways, their response is actually worse than the Pharisees. Now they're not as hostile. They're not attacking Jesus. But the Pharisees hadn't been with him every day. They, they hadn't heard all of his teachings. They hadn't seen all of his miracles. But guess who had? These guys. And Jesus is basically showing them that your response is getting dangerously close to just as bad or maybe even worse to the greatest barriers of my ministry in the gospel, in the gospels. And that's why he says to them, beware, watch out for, it can happen to you, the leaven, the yeast, which often refers to some poison that's made its way into the church or someone's life, of the Pharisees and Herod. Now there's a big debate over what is meant by the leaven of the Pharisees. Some say it's their teaching. Some say it's their influence. In this case, because of what we read in the context, I think he's talking about their unbelief, their lack of faith. This led to a hard heart. And what he's saying to the disciples if, is you are really, really close to the same thing. You don't know how dangerously close you are tight roping on the edge because of your unbelief that you can't see spiritual dullness of having a hard heart before God. Now, what is fascinating to me here is that if you understand the fact that this story was preserved in the gospel for us, this account, this is not just Jesus now pointing out their problem. It's they themselves reflecting backwards, acknowledging their problem because they put the story into the gospel account. It's their way of saying almost to the reader now, oh my, how wrong we were, and you don't miss it too. You don't find yourself in this situation. 
Some have said that Jesus' greatest concern was not their discussion, but it's the spiritual condition that led to their discussion in the first place, that they were so spiritually dull, and this is what grieved the heart of Jesus. So what is Jesus going to do about it? How is Jesus now going to respond to the response? Well, we see it in verse 21, and I'm almost done. We see the feeding, we see the fight, we see the float, and finally we see the focus. Here's what we read. And he was saying then, do you not yet understand? Listen, what we have here is we have a question that in the gospel account, if I can say it this way in some ways, at least as the words on the page for all time goes unanswered. It's an asked question that goes unanswered. And you see that several places in Scripture. One of the places you see it is it's how the book of Jonah ends. It ends with God asking Jonah a question that at least in that book we don't get an answer to. And I think anytime you see that, there's two things that are true about that unanswered question. Number one, the answer to that unanswered question is very important. goes a long way to make the point of what the text is trying to make for us. The second thing is, if those on the page don't a- ask the question... For the writer, for God, less important than how they answer the question is how we answer the question. Because now the question becomes our question, not just their question. Do you not yet understand? So for a moment, let's just, let's just pull out this question and look at it for a moment. Let's do this. I want you to think about this for a moment. When I was a, a seminary professor for six years... Some of you in the room will appreciate this. I did something on my midterms and my finals that my students hated. That may not be a strong enough word. Is there there a strong, loathed, despised? And here's what I would do. It's like one question I'm wanting to ask, but throughout the test, I would ask it about five different times. I would just ask it differently every time. And they thought I was trying to trick them. It wasn't me trying to trick them. It was for me, it was saying, this is the most important thing. And I'm going to use all the means at my disposal to make sure you get this to the point of asking it repetition over and over again so it solidifies in your mind. Now, they thought I was trying to trick them. I thought I was giving them an easy A. (laughs) Because if you can answer the one thing, guess what else you can answer? All the other ones. But the problem is, if you can't answer the one thing, you can't answer the previous ones. Well, Jesus is kind of doing that here. He's asked these five to seven questions, but he's really driving to this one question. Do you not yet understand? What, what is he asking? What does he mean by that? Do you not yet understand what? I am one that believes that Mark's gospel is divided up. It's outlined around two questions. And the second question derives out of the answer to the first question. And I think the gospel is divided almost equally into two parts. Chapters 1 through 8, the first question. Chapters 9 through 16, the second question. We are to the part in the gospel where the first question is starting to be answered, and in a couple weeks we'll see that it is definitively answered. And once it's answered, it's never asked again. You say, great, what is that question? Here it is. Hold on to something, because this is good. Who is this Jesus? By the way, the answer is the Son of God, the Messiah. And once that's answered in the Gospel of Mark, it's never asked again. There's a second question that's asked. So when he says, do you not yet understand, what he's essentially saying to them is, do you know who I am? Not just in the flesh, not just what you see in my name and knowing I'm from Nazareth. Do you know, can I say it another way, who's in the boat with you? Do you know who's in the boat with you? And by the way, by how they're responding up to this point, unfortunately, the answer to this point is, no, not really. They don't. They don't. By their words and their worry, which, by the way, reflected the demand of the Pharisees, they show they do not understand who's in the boat with them. They don't really understand who Jesus is. But here's the point. Remember, that question's not answered. Now what happens is the spotlight moves off of the page and it shines on us. And friends, now it's important for us to answer that question. Do we not yet understand? Do we know who is in the boat with us? Or maybe better yet, who we're in the boat with. You see, it was important for the disciples. I'm not saying it's unimportant. They're they're answering the question. It's important. But this is a question not just for the disciples on the page 
to answer, but it's important for those of us who are in the church and in the world to answer today. So here's the spiritual principle. Here's what we see in this passage. We cannot let spiritual dullness prevent us from understanding who is in the boat with us, who this Jesus is. Say it another way. Everyone must know and trust that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. Just a moment, let me go back to our original question. Is Jesus' identity life-altering? And if so, why or why not? I, I would tell you Jesus' identity is the only identity that's life-altering. Let me give you three statements that I think will help make that point. Here's three statements. Here's why. Because Jesus' identity changes the deficit of our sin. Our sin has created a deficit in our life that we can't pay on our own, and because of who Jesus is, he pays it for us. Number two, Jesus' identity changes the direction of our life. It moves us from going against God, running away from God, now to following God and serving him. And finally, and maybe for us, this is the one that resonates with us the most, Jesus' identity changes the destination of our eternity. Yes, Jesus' identity and how we respond to that identity is life-altering. The reason why is because Jesus' identity is the only one who can alter our identity, the only one that can change our identity. To say it another way, who Jesus is changes who we are. That's what we're seeing in this passage. There was a 2019 song performed by the contemporary group Leland, called Waymaker, that I think in either 2019 or 2022 won the uh, uh, GMA uh, Dove Award Song of the Year. And there's a part of the song, I'm not going to sing it, you don't want me to, but the lyrics just simply stated this, God, you are Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness. That is who you are. Friend, can I say today, can you say today, can we say today with complete confidence, Son of God, Messiah, Savior of the world, that is who you are. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? As Brett and the team begin to make their way up, we're going to have a time of response this morning. And as we do that, I just wonder if there's someone in the room that has never come to the point where they have confidently said, yes, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but I want to make that declaration this morning. I'll be down here at the front. Mike Pitts will be on the other side. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about that. Maybe you're here today, though, and you're a believer and you have trusted that, but you're just saying, you know what, I I I am I in danger of slipping into spiritual dullness? And I don't want to do that. I want my life to serve and reflect that truth that we believe so others can see it. Altars open. I'm here at the front. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about however God is leading you. Let's pray, and when I say amen, we'll begin to respond. Father, thank you so much for this, your word, and thank you that on these pages we see live and living color the life ministry of, and teaching of Jesus. And then we see, when we see that, we can see your love for us through him and the truth of the gospel. Oh, God, help us to confidently say, God, that is who you are. And help us to live our life trusting and displaying the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have your way in this invitation. And whatever you do, we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Turn Your Eyes.
Amen. Hasn't it been a good day to be together in the house of the Lord, worshiping and glorifying Him? Amen? Well, as we close today, I want to introduce something new to you as a church. On the last Sunday of every month, starting today, we're going to start showing uh, slides with pictures and names of those who have joined the church since the last month, but this goes all the way back to January 1st. We're catching the first two months. The reason we're doing this is kind of like baptism videos. If you're in one service uh, and they join in another service, you wouldn't know, and we just want to recognize them, you to get to know them, have a chance to talk to them, but also just celebrate what the Lord is doing. So on the screen behind me is rolling those who have joined our church since the last time. Would you join me in just celebrating what the Lord is doing and what he continues to do in our church? With that in mind, if you're here today and you needed to respond or you still feel like you need to respond but you didn't, it's okay. It's not too late. I'll be out at the Info Hub. Would love to talk with you. Or you can text the word, to, uh, word CONNECT to the number that's on the screen behind me now. And we would love to follow up with you this week to make sure we can connect with you and connect with what God is doing with you. With that in mind this morning, I want us to pray together. I'll lead us. And as we do that, that will be our closing and our benediction. Let's pray together today. Gracious Father, thank you for who you are. And thank you for what you have done. And what you continue to do in our church it has nothing to do with us, Father. It's you and it's for your glory. Thank you for these members. Thank you for those that were here today. And Lord, as we sang in the song today, Lord, we, we believe that in Christ you've allowed us to turn our eyes to you, to turn our eyes to Jesus. And we want to be those that, that are saying to, yes, Lord, our eyes are on you. But help us to live in such a way to where we're pointing others so they can turn their eyes to you as well. As we go out, let us go out as those who have eyes focused on you and have hearts that desire to help others do the same. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and have a great afternoon.